Thank you very much. Uh, what I like to do is, uh, I know that you had to meet the researcher in your in your folders there that uh, speaks a little bit of the background of Dr. Uh, Luigi Ricciotti. Uh, I just uh, I want to emphasize a couple of points there that maybe that you can take advantage or kind of food for thought uh, during his presentation is types of questions and maybe during the break. I think he, he, he has a, the potential to be a, an outstanding resource for you all even after the symposium. Uh, one is that he is, his home base is at the European University Institute. Uh, his focus is on, on, on irregular migration and smuggling network and refugee status uh, 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 studies. Uh, with a focus of the Middle East and, and actually with Palestine, uh, which we look and consider those things far, far away until you're, it's one o'clock in the morning and you're in Deming or Largeburg and you've got someone from the Middle East and you, went, and you wish you knew more. Right or another place, uh, or, or you're down in, in uh, 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 northeast of Palestine. You got an op uh, officer makes a vehicle stop, and you got folks that are speaking so funny. They wishing you more uh, all that, uh, or down in Montana and things of that nature. So I would encourage you during this. I think uh, uh, what Luigi would like as well is as opposed to a lecture where he's speaking and, and speaking at you. On that, I think what he would like is. Is to make this more of an interactive uh, a conversation on that. So I would really encourage you to ask some questions on that, not to feel like you have to wait to the uh, uh, end, ask those questions. Uh, in both sessions, there's two sessions. Um, on purpose, we made a break about 20 minutes with the idea <coughs> that due to his background, you may want to speak to him a little bit, maybe exchange contact information, things of that nature on that. So I, I would definitely um, take advantage of that aspect. Again, thank you for being here today. And with that, Dr. Chen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief, for the nice presentation. And um, <clears throat> so, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks. First of all, let me thank you guys for coming here today. I mean, let me tell you, it's really an honor for me. It doesn't happen often for scholars like myself to have to have an audience of people who knows that the topic of, of our research better than ourselves. So, um, as Chief was saying, I mean, let me let's turn this into more than a lecture because I don't have the um, I don't have the arrogance of being here and lecturing you on something that you know best better than anybody else. Probably. So, if you have any question during the talk, I mean, I mean, feel free to step up and ask a question. Is I mean, criticism, everything is is. Uh, is very welcome as, well, as long as it doesn't involve little the use of little force, of course. <laughs> but it's, please do that, and um, because I mean I'm here to learn also from you, actually. Having said that, so let me thank you, Chief and uh, Leonor, for this organization. Oh, boys, they are really spoiling me. I mean, they they they, they are paying for fancy autos, cars, everything. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to go back anymore now. <laughs> so let's do that tomorrow as well. And um, okay, yeah. Before starting, let me tell you there is an agreement between Chief. I should tell them. There is an agreement between me and Chief. Chief keeps inviting me and spoiling me, and I pay him back with alcohol, with Italian wine, grappa, and this kind of stuff. But so far, the agreement is working perfectly. Uh, I'm getting spoiled, Chief, perhaps he's getting alcoholic, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, is um, so then. <clears throat> as Chief said, I mean, I did more extensive research in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean area, among smugglers and refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, mostly from, uh, from the Middle East. Now, after, after a, uh, almost 10 years of research in the Middle East and uh, Mediterranean area, I, the, I convinced the European Union to pay me uh, to go to come here and, uh, for an extensive vacation in San Diego. No, to do research in Mexico <laughs> and along the US-Mexican border. The reason why it's paying me, the European is paying for something that is not directly related to European interests, because migration to European migration to, along the US-Mexican border is not exactly a priority for Europe, is because we share a common problem. With this is not the presence of too many Italians in both Europe and the United States, but it's, it's rather to do with the fact that both in both Europe and the United States, I mean, the policies implemented to curb and to fight human smuggling have been successful all, to a certain extent. I mean, you know better than me. I mean, they may have curbed the phenomenon, but they have definitely not completely addressed the issue. Human smuggling, smugglers have turned out to be surprisingly resilient, despite I mean, numerous attempts to crack them down. So, 
and regular migration in general has generated real state of emergency in Europe with public opinion and in the United States as well, with a public opinion confused and terrified by the pathetic images of children, of corpses of children lying on the shores of Turkey, Greece, and a corpse of people abandoned under the scorching sun of the desert. And um, well, <clears throat> all this has convinced, has led political leaders to conceive irregular migration as a war. The war where the evil, the evil commander is the smuggler. So in this view, the, uh, to address the problem, I mean, to, in order to guarantee the safety of the nation state and the security, the safety of the, the migrants and the, the security of the nation, well, <clears throat> the, the first, the best solution would be the militarization of border control and the consequent eradication of smuggling networks. Or, as you may know, I mean, this has turned out to be relatively successful, and smugglers are still there. They have changed their modus operandi, but still they are there. At least in Europe, something tells, tells me that if you are here today, also in the United States, the US, US Mexico border. So, <clears throat> what I want to do, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I think these policies have failed is because that to do with the fact that they've been planned by people who have never put a step along the border. Or if they've done, they've done that just to collect a few votes. Policy makers often, they have no idea what the border is. How many of you was, uh, was born or lived a large part of his life or her life along the border? Can you, can you raise your hand? Yes, so pretty much all of you. I was born in a city in southern Italy, close to the border, close to the... Um, in Puglia, if you know Italy, it's like a boot, it's the heel of the boot. And it was a border city. The only difference within uh, the US-Mexican border, the border there was, is the sea. And um, well, for people like us, that it was where they, they had been brought up or they lived a large part of their life in the, along the border, we know that things along the border are never easy. I mean, they're not white and black and white. Not only for the fact that border is something that is a space, it's a space of division, of union at the same time, that makes the border unique in its way. So, I mean, it's precisely <coughs> to shed light on this complexity. I mean, this is what I, one of, what I want to do. I want to shed light, I want to take into consideration this complexity when, we, when, we, uh, when I try to address, shed more light on the complexity, on, uh, on human smuggling, on the evolution of human smuggling. And, um, and to do so, I will compare two major human smuggling apps, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea and the US-Mexico border. Now, in doing so, we, there are, there are <coughs> I have a few aims. One of them is overviewing human smuggling and lighting shared patterns differences between the Europe and the United States, understanding the resilience of smuggling networks in both, in both major, in, both in, in these two major apps, assessing the impact of policy measures on human smuggling and see the consequences of these impacts. Now, <clears throat> as I say, what I'm, what I'm saying today, the finding of my research, on, they are based on ethnography, mostly on ethnographic research in, uh, in the Mediterranean. This involves semi-structured and open-ended interviews with smugglers and refugees, from mostly from Syria, but in general also from other parts of uh, uh, other Asian and Middle Eastern countries. I carried out research especially in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey and Greece, and to a certain extent also along the Balkan route. Now I'm complementing this research with a preliminary research along the US-Mexican border. I spent one, one year in uh, Tijuana and San Diego. However, my research remains very limited. My knowledge of the topic still is, is, uh, is on the making. Well, it's always on the making anyway. So I'd really like um, to hear also what you guys have to say. As I said, please, please feel free to intervene and step up. If you if you think what I'm saying is nonsense, or if you think you have to, there is something else that then we need to know. Please do that. Your knowledge is really valuable here. So now, um, in the first chunk, the first section, I will just give an. <coughs> we just overview the smuggling, uh, the, the, um, the main features of human smuggling, especially in Mediterranean, especially in Mediterranean, and also to a certain extent also along the us Mexican border. And I'll try to, to, um, to see what are the, um, to point out the shared, the common, um, the common features and differences among, among them. So, but let me start with, <coughs> to give you an idea of human smuggling and regular, if you want, illegal migration to Europe along the Mediterranean. Uh, so there are <coughs> two main axes for entering Europe. 
two main um, regular migration is developed along two main axes. One is from uh, west, sorry, from east to west. The one from south to north. Along these two major axes, there are three major smuggling hubs: two in the south and one in the east. Now let's go in order of importance. Well, in order of from the least important to the most important in terms of numbers. So first one, the first, the first of these major hubs, or the least important if you want, is the, the Western uh, Corridor. This goes into Europe through uh, via Morocco and enters into Spain. It was a privileged route of access for mostly for, mostly for uh, Sub-Saharan African migrants, like from Senegal, for example. However, the, the flow of people on this route decreased substantially over the past few years. Still, there are people, but much less than comparison to the other major hubs, major corridors. The second one, which is the East Mediterranean Corridor. Here is where I spend most of my time. Now, this was very popular also in the past, when in 2000, between 19, in the 90s, with something roughly 200,000 people, mostly Albanians, being economic and political distress, entered Italy. Precisely where, where I'm from, actually. <clears throat> and they do that, and um, they do that during a decade. Then uh, the, the, the flow of people decreased substantially and officially died out in around 2005. Now, there are, there are different reasons for that. One is the natural shrinking of the migratory flow. So basically, there are, uh, for Albanians, it was no more convenient coming through regular channels using smugglers to come to Italy. Because it was, they could obtain I mean, uh, legal permits easier than before. The other one is to do with the, the joint efforts of Albanian and Italian police forces managed to, uh, to crack down on numerous migrants. However, this, this route, and if pay attention because it's amazing, it's impressive the number of people who entered. In 2015, 2014, 2015, early 2016, it became a major, the, the main uh, entry point for, uh, for, for um, asylum seekers and refugees, migrants in general, from Asian countries and the Middle East. Something like one million people in 2015 entered Europe through the, through the, through the Eastern Balkan, through the Eastern Mediterranean route, which means from Turkey to Greece, and then they went up to the Balkan route, Greece and, um, let me see whether, so uh, from here, they went up there. Now, most of them, 700,000 of them, in 2015 alone, were Syrian refugees. Now, there are different reasons. The, re the, the very fact that I'm talking about that most of them are asylum seekers and refugees means that most of them left because of warfare, political instability, a number of issues related to political instability and warfare. However, it's not only warfare and political instability that led to this increase in numbers. Much has to do also with the decision of any Balkan countries along the Balkan route to open up their borders to regular migration by issuing temporary transit papers for migrants wishing to cross their territories. This enabled migrants to move freely along the territories of these states for, and to use public transportation for a certain period of time that depended on the migrant and the, and, the, and the issuing country. So, for example, Syrians had six months, Afghans had three days, in Greece they had six, uh, one year, in Macedonia two days, just to give you an idea. Pretty much is what's happening now in Mexico with the caravan. The, the, it's very similar. The caravan, the caravan movement is very similar to what happened also much less, um, with, with, in terms of number, much less people. But still the logic is similar. They get transit papers to move cross freely across the territory and reach, or trying at least to reach the country of destination, which in this case is the United States, for the large majority of them. What happens was that in 2000, in the beginning of 2006, things changed. And you may have already heard the EU-Turkey agreement and the decision of many Balkan countries to close their borders to regular migration. This considerably stemmed down the flow of people to 4% in Greece and 1% of, 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 of the original number of people in the Balkan country. So, almost nobody, not nobody, but way less people cross through these countries. However, the EU-Turkey agreement uh, is highly controversial. Why? Because it's true, on one hand, it's, close, it's, it's reduced the number of people. On the other hand, it's considerably increased the dangers that migrants have to face. More people died trying to reach uh, Europe. As, um, and also, has been in terms of human smuggling, fighting human smuggling has been counterproductive. 
because it's reduced the number of people crossing these territories, but has created, has given the opportunity for smugglers to thrive in countries where they were known. Now, let me be more precise. In the Balkan countries, when they were, the, the borders were open, there were no smugglers. When the borders closed down, following the E-Turkey agreement deal, I mean, EU, uh, Frontex, which is the European Border Patrol, started observing the proliferation or the creation or the establishment of, of smuggling groups. And, and third, last but not least, I mean, many of these people who got stuck in Turkey and in Greece got redirected through different flows. Some have remained there, in Turkey and Greece. Others move along different rural routes. One of them is the notorious Central Mediterranean route, which is the one that goes, um, sorry, this is a pen, uh, that goes from Libya, travels across, travels across Libya, um, is based out of Libya coast and travels across to the to Maltese and, and uh, Italian coast. Now, why notorious? Here is because most people died. It's, um, it takes takes long. It takes a few days. It's all these routes are sea routes, by the way. The western, the, the eastern, the central Mediterranean routes are all with, uh, sea routes, mostly for the very majority of people. Now, it's very just because between 2011 and 2016, something like 630,000 um, uh, migrants entered Europe, enter, uh, arrived to Italian coast via these routes. And now, you know how many of them died between in five years? Let me give you 13,000 lost their lives. So in 2015 alone, 5,000 people died. And now I'm talking about the bodies of those who have turned out because many, other, many, many others died and their corpse was never found, either at the sea or before when they tried to cross the Sahara Desert. We shall see a short video later about that. So, <clears throat> let me now see what's happening along the US-Mexican border. Well, again, this won't be a lecture, you know more than me. So let me point out, I like some of the differences and similarities. Let me also know what you think about it. So, one of the main differences is that irregular migration and uh, it's mostly land migration along the US-Mexican border. And this involves a number of different, as we shall see, a number of differences at times in the way in the US smuggling modus operandi and organizational structure. And then you have one main entry point. I mean, the US-Mexican border is pretty big, it's what, 2,000, 2000 miles? Am I correct? Something like that? Yeah. Anyway, the, the point is that you have just one main country to um, and the southern, the US Mexican border is the Mexico. In the, to, to, so, at the level of policy level, it's easier to deal with one country than, than uh, to deal with many other countries like in Europe, where you have um, a dozen of other countries to deal with. However, despite these, these obvious differences, we have also. So we share something in common, the type of migration. I mean, after Europe, the, uh, the US-Mexican border is the most traveled entry point in a state for irregular migrants. And then we are talking about mix, uh, mixed flow of migrants. I mean, they are not only asylum seekers, they are not only labor migrants, it's a combination of both who makes finding coming out with a policy, uh, a sound policy, it more difficult. And then it's dangerous. And now, if I'm not mistaken, since 1998, something like 7,000 people lost their lives in attempts to, to reach, uh, to cross the border. And again, and this is, I mean, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, I mean, policy responses has not ended the regular migration, also in the United States, along the US-Mexican border, but it's changed the nature of the flow. Now, if you, if you're not mistaken, you have two types of migrants. You have Mexicans and uh, other migrants from Latin American countries, and then those who you call OTM, other than Mexican, am I correct? Now, if I'm not mistaken again, in the beginning where the OTM, where, where the number of OTM was inferior to the number of Mexican and other migrants from Central America, and now things are changing. And this is in part is to do with also with a response and natural adaptation of, national, of migrant flows to policy responses. So, um, questions? So far, so good? I'm doing well, yeah. On the 7,000 deaths, where did you get that number from? I took that from a, um, uh, a report from the IOM, authored by Sheldon Zhang, 
I think is uh, I can give you the, the I think is I don't know where he retrieved his data, but usually is the sound score. But I can give you the I can share with you the references. All right. <clears throat> so let's see the operational cost. Let me focus just in you now. Let me let me shift the attention back to Europe. There are and let me focus on the two major apps of smuggling apps. So I'm talking about the Central Mediterranean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, um, in, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, routes smugglers concentrated in Turkey, operating the small stretch of water um, between Western Turkey and Eastern, Eastern, uh, and Eastern Greece. Now, the people I interviewed, anyway, most people left from isolated areas around the Turkish ports of Izmir and Bodrum, which are on the western coast of Turkey, and to reach Greek islands. Now it took. It doesn't take so long. It's one hour. Uh, it's a one hour uh, journey on, on the rubber dinghy, ten meters rubber dinghy, something like this. Rubber dinghies were, of course, overloaded by smugglers. Something like uh, fifty people were sometimes put on board of these rubber dinghies. That's why sometimes they, they sank. Um, a good swimmer actually could make it on by swimming. Many of these people have never seen the, the, the sea before in their life. And um, along the central Mediterranean route, most smugglers operate in Libya. They profit of the vacuum of power after the fall of Gaddafi's uh, regime. So they are, they are collaborating closely with uh, authorities over there. <clears throat> it's way more dangerous, as we said, because it's, it's a few days. If you, it's a few days um, travel. And nobody, nobody is making the travel to Europe. So, and this is very important, especially in, in, in comparison to what is happening on the US Mexican border. This is the main difference, as we shall see. Now, both in Greece and in Turkey, and in, uh, sorry, both in Turkey and in Libya, smugglers do not come, do not pilot the boats. No way. To minimize the chances of prevention, they just instruct some migrants to pilot the boat. So, in Greece, it's some, a couple of migrants, they don't pay the smuggling fees, they go on board and they pilot the boat. But there are people with very few knowledge of sea or sea of anything related sea related. The same happens along the Central Mediterranean route. But here is way more dangerous because the boats are bigger. They contain much more people, more than fifty, over hundred people. The conditions are terrible, and they, these these boats they don't even have enough fuel to reach European coast. So what they do? Smugglers instruct migrant to launch a distress signal, and then they are rescued by either NGOs, partially in the sea, or authorities, like Frontex, for example. And um, so, the big difference, as we shall see, with, the, uh, with, with what's happening on the us mexican border, that in Europe, smugglers and migrants are actively, are, are actively seek detection. They, they seek to be detected by authorities. They don't try to, 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 they don't run away from authorities. It's the other way around. Because without the intervention of authorities, they would die. And this puts, of course, I mean, Europe and, um, in a very difficult condition. So now there is right-wing politicians, they say, okay, let them sink, let them die. And uh, left-wing politicians, they say, we need to, to stick to the Geneva Convention, to the humanitarian whatever, and we need to, to, to rescue these people otherwise. So, <clears throat> now, and... Um, Again, let me see a very quick look glance at the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, most most of people they enter they, they travel across Mexico in, in a different in, in different ways, in a very famous way. But actually, what I was what I noticed is not the most used way, but is perhaps the most mediatized way is the, the la bestia is the railways uh, the train that takes them the travels across Mexico from south to north. Now, what's interesting here is that uh, the, um, the policies implemented by the Mexican government, especially the Plan La Frontera Sur, is changing also the, the, the way smugglers use and the way also regular migrants move. So La Besa is increasingly less used because uh, tra tra train stations are increasingly <coughs> partial. So they are relying more and more, migrants and smugglers are relying more and more on um, private cars, on um, buses. Most of them move through bus, with buses. Anyway, when they, I was told that is by by few migrants and also a few other interview with um, border patrol that is the average 
it's difficult to say the average because it depends where you cross. It's something like between four and four thousand to six hundred US dollars to cross the board. Now, I don't know whether this is what's happening along the US-Mexican border, but in, in Europe there is a much, um, there is a great deal of saying, follow the money, you cash a smuggler. In Europe it's not working because, I mean, it's difficult to say how much would they pay the smuggler. First of all, because smuggling fees change uh, during the years. For example, in, in, in winter time, in order to encourage people to use, the, the, to use their services, smugglers reduce the cost of smuggling fees. Or sometimes smugglers get ripped off by migrants. It's more common than expected. Smugglers they left without paying the full um, the full uh, the full fees. Other times, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, other times they um, and most importantly, not all money goes into the pocket of smugglers. In Europe, in the Mediterranean, at least, most of money goes into the pocket of local communities. People that are let's say, loosely affiliated with smugglers. They are like freelancers. So, hotel operators, for example, uh, bus drivers, and many other people <coughs> like that. So, again, what's the difference? As I said before, the difference is that, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that along the US-Mexican border, guides accompany the migrants, escort the migrants across the border. It's not, the travel is not made alone, usually. And the migrants try to avoid detection. Well, as migrant, of course, as well. So they get they there. They go into stage. They hide once they cross the border. They may go into stage and they may hide into stash houses for for several days, and they stay hidden until they don't. They don't I mean, possibly until they are not caught by border patrol. This is exactly what exactly the opposite of what's going on in Europe. The, so far, so good. Do you have anything to add? Okay, I'm doing so well. <laughs> no, well, we get. If, uh, thank you, I'm flattered. So let's see the typology. In general, both in Europe and in, the, and, uh, and in Mexico and along the US-Mexico border, we have a variety of organizations, it's different. This organization can be put somewhere into a continuum that goes from single service providers to multi-service networks. I mean, uh, multi, the single service providers are small, Independent organizations who, enter, who um, operate almost exclusively, exclusively. Sorry, do you understand my pronunciation? Is so Italian, I speak like a Godfather sometimes. <laughs> <sighs> it bothers me, but it's, yeah, it's nothing to do. So they operate just the, the, the border crossing. They are they have solid roots in the country, in the transit country. So in Turkey, they are Turkish, mostly managed by Turkish uh, Turkish nationals, Mexico, the Mexicans. They, the recruitment happens through intermediaries, the recruitment of migrants. And um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have, we have the multi-service networks, bigger and open and wide-ranging organization. These, they operate sort of like sort of dysfunctional touristic agencies, if you want, by providing migrants with a number of services that ranges from uh, release from detention centers to food accommodation, sometimes even entertainment. And they have offshots also in the country for origin of migrants. And they operate from the beginning to the end of the migrant's journey. So it's migrant journey is a pre-organized stage stage process. It's usually <clears throat> that the structure, it depends very much on the complexity of the journey. So uh, migrants who need um, who cannot move on their own for for large legs for make for uh, for large legs of their journey, they, they would probably rely on this big organization. Whereas in migrants, they have quite a freedom of movement. They just, they, they, they go as big as you go. So they use the migrant, they, the smuggling group where they, where they need it. And they do it uh, by themselves, where, 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 they, are, where the, the needs of a guide, they are not uh, crucial to, to make the crossing or to move. So, <coughs> structure. I mean, that structure of smuggling networks at first sight can be, is quite complex. I mean, we have top men, recruiters, guides, money collector, forgers, suppliers, enforcers, receivers, so all these people are. However, the complex organigram of smuggling networks may not lead you to think that at least, and I would like to know, because I have the impression that this is also what's going on on the US-Mexican border. I may not lead you to think that uh, in the Mediterranean, we are talking about 
hierarchical and complex organization. This is not the case. My findings and the findings of other researchers along the US-Mexican border and in the, my findings in the Mediterranean show that um, these organizations are not highly hierarchical and complex structures. But they, are, they consist of, um, consist of uh, a network of flexible independent groups who enter into partnership for a short period of time, but they remain independent. The roles, the roles within this organization may, may, may be that one of guide, of recruiter, whatever. They're not integrated into rigid hierarchies and not bound by long-term agreements. So you can work as a guide, you can work and be a recruiter at the same time. And they're not bound by long-term agreements. So this means that, for, just to give you an idea, I mean, the captain of a, a smuggling group in Turkey, he called himself, he quit his involvement in the, in the smuggling organization almost overnight. And I was there when he did that. And he says simply, he, I mean, he was wished good luck by his, uh, his former affiliates. Nothing happened to him. It's not like, you know, this kind of sturdy bound in that you can witness, that you can see, observe in mafia organizations where you are bound to life, and if you get out, you get killed. <coughs> However, these are a lot of people that are involved in smuggling networks, even if these groups are small and independent. But these people, as we, as we mentioned before, as I mentioned before, are mostly locals. That they work as, as freelancers by providing a number of services to the smuggling networks. So they may rent their subleasing their lands, renting their boats. They may work as, as drivers, or as keepers. But, but let me give you an example. Let me give you. Let me tell you a story. Once I was in Turkey. I had the opportunity to interview extensively the members of the smuggling group and to spend some time with them. Basically, what they do was, one day I was interviewing this man, uh, and I was sitting in a fast food in uh, this uh, city in, uh, on the western border, of, in the western um, coast of Turkey, <coughs> on the east, western coast of Turkey. Well, well, during the interview, we were approached by the owner of the fast food, who asked me who told I was a smuggler as well, because he knew pretty much who the smugglers were. And he asked me whether I was interested in renting the boat of his cousin for doing some smuggling. So for them, it was a way to round up the salary. I mean, they were, they were not involved into human smuggling, not directly at least. But for them, it was perfectly normal. And the same was when I was young in Italy, in Puglia, the same was, was normal. The many fathers of my, fri of, of, um, of my friends were working well, as a cigarette smugglers, but sometimes they didn't. They also like, let me do some human smuggling as well. You know, a way to round up the salary, especially when they, when they, when they lost the cigarette cargo at sea. And, they, and cities in Puglia, where I'm from, and also in Italy, uh, also, sorry, in Turkey, the, the, very, the, 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 same very, the, the very same city where I did research, I spent a lot of time, these cities would normally die out in, uh, normally die out in, in wintertime because they are uh, touristic cities. They actually thrived in wintertime because of smugglers and because of migrants. So the hotels were packed with migrants, the fast food were packed with migrants and smugglers, the drivers, taxi drivers, were working as well for the smuggling groups. It was normal. I mean, they were making a lot of money. So most of the money actually went to the, to the city, to the locals. Dr. No. Dr. I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, uh, did you find that the smugglers, let's say in Turkey you're speaking, did they look at, the, did they view themselves as smugglers? Or did they view yeah. themselves as someone just that's that's a very good question. Well, let me not spoil the fun. I, I will get back to that in the <laughs> next section. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thank you for the question. A very good question. So why? Now, <clears throat> the idea, my my understanding is this is happening, especially because why did why this structure? Why this more inflexible structure? This is as much to do. This is my assumption. But feel free to disagree. As much to do with um, with the market. It's a market characterized. It's a market of um, characterized by high levels of instability and unpredictability. It's a market of the fast changing scenario of border control. All of a sudden, you can find yourself without work. So there is no, in this sense, human smuggling. Let, let's see, put the case, for example, of the Eastern Mediterranean route where uh, one million people transit in 2015, and in the next year there was nobody, not not nobody, but less and less people. So you, you lose your job. So in this sense, human smuggling is more than, for many people, is, is a crime, of course. But for many people, it's not, uh, for many of the smugglers, it's not like a criminal career, 
like becoming a drug kingpin. But it's more like a negative copy mechanism to get by. It, makes you, makes, it gives you a lot of money, but you already know that you are not doing that for long. It's just a copy mechanism, negative copy mechanism. Now, what I want to, what I would like to know is, um, I would like to ask you a question. Do you think it's changed human smuggling over the past years? The structure and modus operandi of human smugglers along the US-Mexican border? What's your experience? Yes? In which way? I would say, you know, they've been using the different techniques, you know, trying to avoid. Because sometimes, you know what, believe it or not, I think sometimes media uh, try to reveal what we do. Right. You know, and these guys, somehow, you know, they got their falcons or advisors who pretty much, you know, tell them the way we operate, sometimes we don't pay attention. Right. And they got plenty of time to do, you know, just to get an idea how we operate. To, to get across. That's very true. Uh, in the Mediterranean, many many of these smugglers I interviewed, they were using, they were relying on social media and media in order to, to you know, to, to better do their job because it was a way for them to, to tailor the job according to the changes. Yeah. The, the stuff that he's talking about, when we're closer, like here at entry, that stuff changes. But the bigger picture from country of origin up this way since we don't have a lot of the control like originating in South or Central America and through Mexico <coughs> and the, the interviews that we've conducted it seems like nothing's changed right. so even with the policies the roots like you were saying they're not using uh, La Bestia as much but a lot of the stuff that's coming in from again Central and South America they're the same name the same names still keep popping up that you know in Colombia and stuff that we've been hearing for the last 10 years that's the name of the smuggler area yeah. The, the so points of contact along the trails are are similar to, to ones that I that we've encountered for for many years. But along the U.S. Mexico border, these things have changed. Things change because you have a more direct control. Well, because as he was mentioning, our MO across the border has to change according to the threat that we're facing. So they're adapting to us, which makes us have to change our operation. But and I would think that would. Be similar across the southern border but as far as coming from country of origin up through mexico a lot of that stuff has remained the same mm, that's interesting so what i was told i also heard that smugglers on the us mexican border are increasingly using um mobile phones so basically they don't they're they are including they are slowly getting adjust to the way the european way of smuggling so they don't escort migrants firsthand but they are using phones they are remotely piloting them escorting them through so to reduce chances and risks of prevention, and this was a consequence of the increasing of your, I mean, because you are doing a good job, you are relying to different systems. Is that true, right? Yeah. But yes. so that's interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> how are we doing with time? So far so good? Yep. So the question is, I mean, we say, this may be, this, this I think is the most important part, I mean, at least it's the most interesting part for me. Maybe for you it's the most boring, but, but I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's safe, I mean, human smuggling is a multi-billionaire business. Now, I don't remember what this, what Europe all says in Europe, I think it's five billion years, I don't know, something like that, in one year. So, I mean, we are talking about good money, definitely more when, than what I make with my salary. <laughs> so, it would be, it's said that it's a multi-billionaire business. It's also said that criminal rings, I mean, that is run alongside other illegal uh, trades, such as drug, weapon, human trafficking. So it would be normal to think, to assume that, well, if it's such a multi it's such a lucrative business, so why organizations are not taking, bigger criminal organizations are not taking over? Like mafia, for example, or like cartels, narco cartels, or like terrorist organizations. This is a serious issue in, in Europe. Because especially uh, uh, in in uh, in the Middle East, where there is the Islamic State, where where we say only in 2005, in 2015, in the Middle East, in Syria, I think there are one to 11, 11 million displaced people, and like six of six million of them, something like that, have left Syria. So I mean, we are talking, and they all do it through regular channels, a very large majority. <coughs> a lot of money are circulating there. So is human smuggling? entered by large criminal groups? This is the question. Like mafia, cartels, terrorist organizations. Now, 
My findings and the findings of other researchers shows that this is not the case. Large criminal groups have not consistently entered the smuggling of migrants as a means of self-financing. Interaction, there, there has been interactions with large criminal groups and smugglers, but this mostly involves the taxation, taxing. So basically, large criminal groups are taxing smuggling groups. Let me give you a couple of examples. <coughs> I won't go, I don't know enough about the um, narco, narco cartels. Let me give you an example of Italian mafia, the Sacra Coronomita, which is the mafia from, uh, from where I was born, uh, in the region where I was born, and um, which is the weakest of the mafias, but anyway, still mafia. And, um, and then, it's not disappointing. It's, it's disappointing. I, mean, I, have, I have the love of being a mafia guy, at least let me go with the strongest one. <laughs> no, the weakest, anyway. Um, and the Islamic State, Especially, I think it's interesting, the Islamic State. Let me, because it, it, it would be normal to assume that the Islamic State is taking over human smuggling. I mean, it's both a way of self-financing the terroristic activities and as, way, and, and, and as a way of in, and, uh, infiltrating its operatives in Europe and the or in the United States for what it matters. However, um, financial, um, sorry. <coughs> Yeah, sorry. The Islamic State financial records retrieved by, by you guys, by the US Special Forces in Iraq and Syria, shows that the Islamic State is quite a diversified mechanism of revenue generation. But smuggling is not mentioned in their, in their financial um, data. Why that? <laughs> what they do is, much, much of the money that the Islamic State makes is made out of looting stock resources. So basically, the sale of natural resources, like oil, gas, to a lesser extent, um, phosphate, cement, and agricultural products, makes accounts to 80 and 60% of the total budget, the total income, in, income budget, of the total income in 2014 and 2015. However, the Islamic State has also resorted to a variety of other practices, right? For example, extortion in, in order to um, criminal practices, in order as a complementary means of financing, such as kidnapping for ransom, extortion, one of them has been the taxation, taxing uh, traders, uh, smugglers, who move their cargo, human beings or any other, any other type of cargo, across their territories, but has not entered human smuggling. The same happens with mafia. So when the, 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 one of the closest po contact points between mafia and their smuggling groups, both Albanians and Italian smuggling groups, human smuggling groups was during the Albanian crisis, you remember, between in the 90s when almost 200, well, something like 200,000 people entered Europe, into Italy. Now, even in that case, there are no evidences of police, uh, shows that there are no evidences of collaboration, of uh, management of the human smuggling business from the Sacra Coronita, which is the map from Italy, from, from Puglia. Now, they pay the pizza. Interviews that I did with smugglers, with retired smugglers in Puglia, <coughs> they, they, they actually, they actually confirmed that. They say, we pay the pizza. Pizza, you know what's pizza, right? Is uh, I think in Spanish it's piso. It's a sort of tax that you pay. I mean, other, if you, uh, you can pay it also if you run an illicit business like a restaurant. So they pay the pizza. They were taxed like any other legal illicit business. And um, they paid pizza to the mafia people, but they were not managed by mafia guys. And well, the very fact that they paid a, a, a tax, they were taxed by mafia, this is, an, this is obvious an evidence of the fact that these organizations were not managed by mafias. Otherwise, there was no need of taxing them. So, why that? Again, I would like to hear your opinion. <coughs> but one of the reasons is, is we, we have scanned data about that. So, I'm coming just with assumptions. One of the reasons has made to do with structural differences. Mafia organizations, big criminal organizations like Mafia, uh, probably also narco cartels, and um, terrorist organizations like the Islamic State, they have big, very hierarchical, hierarchical structure, very well structured. They are suited to, to exert control over the territory. But they are not as good as to adapt to the fast change in scenario of border control. To do that, you need a smaller, and uh, independent group, loosely with loosely affiliated people, more 
more prone to, to deal with, uh, with uh, an unpredictable scenario. And this has also to do with the high visibility of irregular migration. Um, this was an interview uh, by a colleague of mine. She made it with, with narco cartels, with uh, sorry, with uh, smuggled migrants. They say that um, that drug dealing, that, that one of the reasons why drug dealers are not entering is the fact that in uh, they prefer to keep migrants out of drug trafficking routes, most likely to avoid an unwanted attention from enforcement. Think about the caravan how much attention got. You, if you are drug, if you are dealing drug with drug, you don't have to lose attention. Anyway, what, what about the narco, the, the, what about the Los Zetas and these kind of groups? Do you think they are managing human smuggling? What, what's, your, what's your knowledge, side knowledge? Well, we can discuss this later on anyway, I'll get back to that. So let me sum up. There are differences between human, within human smuggling in the, along the, in the Mediterranean and along the US Mexican border. One is modus operandi, the other one is the, the fact that perhaps the most important is the way of doing of vis a vis, -vis, with, vis, -a -vis you guys. I mean, smugglers, they, they, they try to have their merchandise and their, their, their clients detected in Europe as soon as possible. This to have, in order to have a successfully um, accomplished smuggle operation. <coughs> To have a successfully accomplished smuggling operation on the US Mexican border, you don't have to be detected by authorities. It's a completely different way. Similarities, it seems that mostly we are talking about small independent groups with flexible and adaptive structures. The other one is the dispersion of revenues generated by the business. I mean, most of money, not all money goes into the pocket of smugglers. There are a lot of money, like they have to pay piso or pizza, they have to pay. Uh, also, many other actors that work as freelancers. And now, the demand and the complexity of the journey generate and shape the offer. This is interesting, and uh, this seems to me uh, that is happening also along the US Mexican border. In Europe, as we say, the, the, the increasing border control has, uh, has led as, um, as um, not as only has changed the channels of operations, as has right directed irregular flows along different routes. But also the way those migrants operate. Migrants are relying more and more in this, in this um, to, to, um, to remote control. So they don't, they don't, they don't go, they don't accompany migrants, uh, migrants first time, but they, they, they pilot them either through phones. And this is, it looks like it's happening also on the US Mexican board, even to a lesser extent. It will be interesting to see whether this will be the future with increasing border control. So, <clears throat> Is, um, so this is, let's say, this is the end for the first section, and um, do you have questions? you have questions for me? I do. Yeah. Compared to the, you know, people that come to the United States in general to have a better life, in your own experience in the European countries, do you think it's about the same concept when you move like you mentioned, from south to north, or east to west, Europe, could it be the same, or do they have another yeah another um, agenda? I think is um, more or less is the same. You know, we tend to divide you want, um, because it's true to a certain extent. I mean, you, uh, smart, uh, migrants, labor migrants from asylum seekers, asylum seekers uh, <coughs> flee from they are pushed by push factors such as war, uh, starvation, whatever. And somehow they are more entitled to receive assistance. And then we have labor migrants. Those, these people are pulled by factors such as uh, uh, a better economy in the country of arrival, like in this case the United States, better I mean, a better future, looking for a better future in terms of, often in terms of money-wise and labor-wise, career-wise. So labor migrants are pulled. Somehow are not entitled because they are pulled. They can stay where they are. Nobody's pushing them out. And uh, Asylum seekers are pushed. What I notice is that, yes, of course, there are extreme cases where there are people that fit perfectly in the category. So, people that are perfectly uh, labor migrants and people that are obviously refugees. But in many cases, it's a combination of both. So, even among asylum seekers and asylum seekers who are fleeing the war, many of them they decided they, they wanted to go to Germany or to Italy because it's, pardon my French, the economic uh, system in Italy is fucked up. So, you want to go to Italy, to, to Germany. But they were, they were refugees. 
by the way, reasoning also is a labor magnet. And I think the same is going on here. Like um, I interview, I interviewed um, a few of um, migrants from the caravan in Tijuana, and many of them were fleeing violence, or at least this is what they claimed. But they were saying they were they were coming to the United States also for, because it was better for not only for escaping violence because they could have escaped perhaps also staying in other cities in Mexico. I don't know to what extent, but in other countries, and uh, at least they could have fled persecution moving to another country, but they wanted to go to the United States also because it was better for their working career, for their life. So it's a combination of both. And I think it's, it's the same in both in Europe and all the US Mexican board. No questions? It's gotta be another question. There, there's a there's a UTEP challenge card for this. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. I think we have two two challenge cards. <laughs> Reference to based on your experience, you probably know what you know. You're not an asylum officer, but what you heard for some people, you know, we know immigration officers. Uh, uh, we know pretty much, you know. And also, there's a right to privacy. We cannot disclose information. But in your, in your general knowledge, for a person for apply for asylum in the European countries, is it a difficult process? Or how do you describe it in your words based on your experience? That's a good question. It depends very much on the type of um, country. So what do we have in Europe is the, the Dublin Agreement, which is highly discussed. So basically, you are, you, are, you, apply for, you are forced to apply for asylum in the first country of arrival. This means that countries at the border of Europe, like Italy, Spain, Greece, they are somehow not really, I mean, um, how you say, they are quite. Uh, they don't really benefit of this agreement because all people are applying for asylum in, their, in these countries. Whereas Germany, Norway, if you come from the seaside, I mean, there is no way you arrive to Germany. I mean, coming from the south, uh, from the, the south Mediterranean. So it depends very much on the country. It looks like in Italy is easier than many other countries, and Greece as well. But because of the being an economic situation, what it is in Greece and in uh, and in. Uh, and in, uh, in Italy, I mean, most people, they don't want to apply for asylum in Italy and Greece. This again goes back to the mix, the mix, the combination of factors. It can be both asylum and refugee, uh, asylum seeker and labor migrant at the same time. So what, what they do, most people, they, they try, even when they reach Italy. <clears throat> well, in Italy, you get, what you do, you get is, um, I mean, because of the way of uh, we deal with the, with uh, human smuggling and with regular migrants, you are apprehended. There is almost no way you enter Europe in the, in the, Italy undetected, because there, there is no way you can make it to Europe. Maybe a few cases of <laughs> very rich who paid speedboat, but there is no way. Usually, mo the very large majority of them are rescued and brought back to Europe and then processed in Europe. And they, more, all of them, they ask for asylum. They put a, they, they they file an asylum claim. Those who are deemed to be worth whose asylum claim is deemed to be worth valid, they get asylum or any other protection. Those who are not in war, theoretically they are deported. But as a matter of fact, it's so expensive that many of them, the deportation is not implemented consistently. So what they do, they go into hiding and maybe go into Germany. And they stay, well, undetected, they, stay, they, they, they work in the legal market regularly, they say. It depends very much. Once your question, it depends very much on where you ask, where you where you where you put your claim, where you file your claim of asylum. Yeah. Uh, I, don't know. I have a question. Yeah. Um, a lot of our like they come from the south. I guess are uh, they're coached to what to say, like to for to ask for asylum. A lot of them is the same story. Like it's almost like script that they give them. Is the same thing over there. Uh, this is up in up in along the Eastern border. You yeah. see. Yeah, it's funny because some, it depends. It depends. Sometimes when you when you hear over and over the same story, uh, yeah, probably they are just making up their story. Not that their claim is not valid, but let's say, for example, many Pakistan. This story is funny because many Pakistani migrants they fled to to Europe and they ask for asylum. Maybe some of them, they obviously some of them, they valid uh, asylum claim, right? But almost all of them, all of I met, the bunch of migrants, Pakistani migrants, who I met. In, along the route in the Eastern Mediterranean, but all, all of them claim to be homosexual and to have fled because of, because they were persecuted as homosexual. But obviously, many of them were not homosexual. And when they spoke about their homosexuality, they actually felt ashamed because in their, they didn't want to be considered homosexual, but this was the best way for them, in their eyes, to get asylum in Europe. 
So they were kind of, you know, for they they were it was very controversial for them. I, I'm yeah, I'm homosexual. Yeah, <laughs> but this was obviously not what they wanted. To be. You know, you were talking about the routes that they're taking and stuff like that. How do they differ from the narcotic routes and stuff like that? The reason you know, I'm asking you is because a lot of times they'll send a group in one area that you work in, usually in a rural area. They'll send a group in, a, uh, in an area and everybody goes to them, and then they'll send the drugs on. Mm. So, are they using that same thing? Uh, that's a good question. About mm, drug routes in, uh, in Mediterranean, I know, I know less than human smuggling routes. What I know is that it depends on, on, on uh, I mean, large part, a large part of cocaine, for example, comes to Calabria. From uh, from Central America, from Mexico, right? Most of cocaine that floats market in Europe comes from Calabria, and from come 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 from Mexico it goes into. It's through this negotiation between uh, Mexican cartels and um, the Calabria mafia, which is called Andrangheta. They have the strong one, and um, not from Europe. No, not like from Mexico <laughs> only. They are the lucky ones. Anyway, and these in this case the routes are different. Because there are no my Mexican coming uh, like that. But for example, from Albania, the routes were similar, but they were not operated by the same. So when they were bringing marijuana, uh, they were using the same routes, Albania, the same sea routes, because it's, it's, it's a small stretch of water. But they, but they operate in very different ways. So smugglers, I know because I interviewed the human smugglers and eventually recycled himself into a drug dealer. But he didn't do the, the two things together at the same time. So often the, 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 there is no convergence of market, but they may use the, the, the route, the geographical area may be the same one. Like for example, much of opium and heroin comes from Afghanistan, and many, Af many Afghan people have sold asylum, but they are not using the same. Uh, they are using the same. They are not using the same channels. So for example, when it comes to, when it comes to Albania, Albanian drug dealers, they they use. Uh, they didn't, uh, human smugglers did fast boats in order to get to the Italian coast as soon as possible, trying to, to escape detection. Uh, drug dealers use very slow boats and they try to, mm, to pass a notice, like, you know, like thinking they are fishermen or whatever, because they knew if they do it fast, they would have probably be detected. But because this is, with a small boat, you can put a lot of cocaine inside, but you can put very few migrants. So it was not convenient for the, the, the smugglers to put so many three migrants and going very fast. It was. So the, the route was different, but the, the, the most operant in them was um, completely different. And they didn't do that together. They also, the smugglers interview, they say, we don't want to take on board our drug or with the fast boats, because if we get caught with human drug, human smuggling and drug dealing at the same time, you get much more. It's not convenient. So either you do one or you do the other one. As a matter of fact, many of them some of them eventually recycle themselves as a drug dealer. So then, is it, is it heavily penalized to be a smuggler of humans uh, and to be a drug smuggler? Does that, like here we try to enforce immigration laws and criminal laws to send a message that you will be penalized for committing these crimes. And, do you see that they get penalized for that? Yeah, but is he only, uh, let me ask you just a quick By year on the US Mexican border, you get more penalized if you, drug, if you are drug dealing rather than if you are drug smuggling rather than human smuggling. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah, the same goes in Europe. <clears throat> and um, so that's why most of the people who really go into a, a criminal career as a drug dealer are criminal, car criminal to court, whereas many of the people, many of the smugglers are criminals because what they are doing is a crime. But they are not, let's say, um, Hardened criminals, they're not, um, let's say, big shots, and they, 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 they do that as a coping mechanism, many of them. So, for example, when there are a lot of cigarette smuggling in Italy, in my region, cigarette smugglers, they were, it was normal smuggling cigarettes. It was like, I mean, what do you do? I work in a restaurant, do you do it? I mean, no, my father is smuggling cigarettes. And, um, <laughs> yeah, completely normal. Most of my friends' fathers were smuggling cigarettes. Not my family, yeah. <laughs> I will end up in prison after this talk. <laughs> and um, so what happens is they didn't want to smuggle human beings, and for sure they didn't want to smuggle a drug. Sometimes they enter into human smuggling because it was a way to, um, let's say, it was a, um, it was a way to um, reduce damage. It's a way of coping with the loss of the cargo. 
So what happens when they lost the cargo because you needed money to to buy the, to pay to buy the cigarettes in advance and then you sell it back in Italy. You buy the cigarettes in Montenegro, you sell it back to Italy. When they lost the cargo and they didn't have enough money to buy the, the, the cigarettes, what they do was smuggling. It was just just a way to get by for the next batch of cigarettes because smuggle because people human beings pay in advance. But it's usually in careers. Uh, criminal careers, in terms of uh, cigarette smuggling, drug dealing, and human smuggling, they tend to, 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 there is no really convergence. They don't do that, all, they don't uh, do that all together. I mean, there are different people, all the same people who does that on different times of his life, or her life. So, I have a question for you. What, what do you find, I mean, feel free, I mean, uh, I, I won't, I'm not a sensitive, sensitive so, I mean, feel free, what is relevant? What has been most relevant for you, or the least boring thing, what I say today? I mean, I'm, I'm interested to see what is what may be relevant for the European case for you, for for US uh, law enforcement. <coughs> what what, you, what did you find interesting, or uh, less boring? Yeah. Well, we're not too familiar <coughs> with the trends of the how they get smuggled in, say, the Middle East as opposed no. to in the U.S.-Mexico border, or we're not used to dealing with oceans here, so that's you know more interesting than what we deal with here. What I found interesting in my research is that is uh, everything is uh, is that um, especially when it comes to Islamic State, I was expecting these big organizations to take him over. He was smuggling. Instead, they don't, which is quite surprising. Well, we're <laughs> we're seeing the same thing. Along with, like at the cartel level, they we're seeing now that, like like you mentioned about the peso, they're they're taking that. But I think it's more of a logistical. They don't want to spend the manpower in trying to oversee those alien smuggling organizations working in their area. It's easier for them to take money off the top end and not have to worry about it. And they're getting revenue coming into their organization. That's very interesting. We will get back to that in the okay. second section. But it's very interesting. How do you guys track their migration once they come into the country of, not country of um, destination, but the country of origin, right? They come in, let's say, from Italy. Since Italy, Spain, Switzerland, um, France, <coughs> they all have open borders. Mm. So how do you track who's still within country once they come in? Yeah. And who leaves country to those destinations where they want to be, such as France, mm. um, Germany? Very good question, yeah. That's, that's a very good question, especially for in, uh, in the European context, it's a very relevant question because, you know, when you, in Europe we have the Schengen area, which is pretty much like you have here. I mean, you can move from California to Arizona and nothing, I mean, you don't necessarily go through a checkpoint, then, correct? Or you do? There are checkpoints. There may be checkpoints, but it's, I mean, you can move freely, you need a passport you need to cross. And this, this is what's happening in Europe as well, since the creation of the establishment of the Schengen area and the... Uh, mm, what happens is that migration, irregular, irregular migration, is changing the shape of Europe. So the Schengen area has been suspended in certain places. Because as a matter of fact, in, they were not, these, move, these people were moving undetected. Precisely because, as you say, how do you do it in a place where there are no words? So this is what was happening. So what happened is that the Schengen area in certain areas suspended, for example, so along certain parts of the border with Austria, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they were creating. Um, Temporary borders, anyway. Uh, uh, border patrol are, are patrolling the, the border. Like, for example, along the uh, between the Austrian Italian border, sometimes uh, authorities are, are increasingly starting patrolling place to the border, whereas before there was no any form of patrol, patrolling, if not very minimum patrolling, patrol. And they, they come sometimes they come. They have a, there is a bilateral agreement. They can they may come to Europe to Italy, the Austrian Austrian uh, forces law enforcement, and then in order to seek to, to, to find uh, prospective regular migrants and smugglers. Because what happens is funny, that is, I don't know whether, well, probably it's not here, like because it's different, because everybody wants to enter in, uh, in the United States. Whereas in many transit countries, it's funny that you can see in the, ent in the, in the, ent in the entering border, so let's say Turkey, Syria, for example, the border forces, the border, the, the law enforcement fight the smugglers. At the exiting border, like or like Turkey, Greece, they actually collaborate. I mean, or at least they, there is a tacit, tacit, um, very sort of. I mean, 
implicit collaboration with smugglers because smugglers do the job. They keep out, they let the, they let the people out. And this, I saw this in Greece as well, exactly the same. So, so Italian forces to say what? Because Italian uh, law enforcement, they are not too keen to stop migrants to enter Austria, right? So Austrians and Austrian authorities now are increasingly coming. There, there was a sort of diplomatic accident because they came, they, 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 they made a raid, a raid, raid in, uh, in, in Italy, in the Italian territory without having advice, without having asked the consensus. Of it. So it was, but they do that. This is in order precisely to stop um, the movement, the regular movement of migrants. Thank you very much.